it's time to officially review the upcoming season of Marvel Snap Cards, which means locking in my star ratings so that you can all, you know, enjoy my idiocy in the future. But uh, we just got the latest season update today, which gives us the final versions of these cards. We also know what the meta looks like right now, so we can kind of talk about these with the right numbers and the right context and hopefully give them the right star ratings. But we're going to kick things off here with Erishim because... Still yet, I think this looks like the coolest, craziest, most insane card in Marvel Snap. And I've kind of talked myself into thinking it might actually be good, too. So if you haven't seen Erishim yet, this is a 7 cost, 7 power card. At the start of the game, plus 1 max energy, but also shuffle 12 random cards into your deck. So you're getting that... Electro or Corvus Glaive ramp buff right from the start, which we know how powerful that ramp buff can be. We've seen Electro uh, ramp decks just driven completely by that little bonus curve that unlocks where you can often play multiple six drops in a row to close the game. Doctor Doom into Odin is the classic example, but there are certainly some, some more modern variations of that as well. But Erisham just gives it to you from the beginning. Now, that is an enormously crazy good upside, right? Just being able to play above curve every single turn literally is a huge bonus. But the downside is you're getting 12 random things put into your deck, which means uh, most of your draws are, I guess, really about half your draws or a little more than half because Erisham's kind of a bad card too, are going to be potential junk. You don't know what you're going to get. You may get low synergy things that don't help you at all, right? You might get a Patriot and you don't need a Patriot because you have a bunch of cards with tech. So some of your draws are just going to be completely dead. They're also just going to be a really mixed bag when it comes to curve. You don't really know what you're going to get. But here's my thought, right? These Electro Ramp decks of the past often had pretty weak early games. Like sometimes you'd have a Jeff or a Nebula or something in there, but it's not like they're making really powerful plays from like turns one to three in particular. They're really hitting their stride on turn four, which is kind of their five energy turn, turn five and six, where they're playing those six drops. In other words, you can recover enough on those final few turns to really make the difference. And Erishim's going to allow you to do that in many cases because you're probably just gonna be able to stuff your deck, your real deck, with big stuff, right? Just like a bunch of awesome big six drops, maybe the same sort of package you'd have in an Electro Ramp deck. But you're also going to have these filler cards where you have a chance to just draw like two drops and three drops and, and, and four drops that you're gonna be playing on curve as little bonus filler while you're getting all of these turns to hopefully accrue enough of your big six drops that you stuffed into the deck. I mean, you could literally put like eight six drops or something in your deck, but theoretically, you know, 11, anything except Erishim, and just really ensure that you're hitting those big late game power plays because you are going to draw into your deck, right? And not always, it's, of course, technically you could draw all random cards, but the odds are you're gonna hit some of your own cards and if you really stack your deck in your advantage, then you're gonna have that late game guaranteed with Erishim giving you the opportunity to fill in. Cause yeah, sometimes it'll be Patriot and you'll be sad, but sometimes it'll just be like a Nocturne or something you're like, okay, cool. I got a random Nocturne. That's a pretty good card. I'm happy to play that on turn three. A Spider-Man, like sure, I'll play that on turn three. Colleen Wing on turn two. It's like, normally you wouldn't be all that excited about that, but I've got my late game plan going. I mean, yeah, I'll take a bonus two four. Like that's kind of cool to have early or actually that's on turn one, I guess. And this deck, so Colleen Wing on turn one is, is, you know, a nice little bonus. That's, that's going to help you outscale your opponent. So just filling in the gaps with cards that are on average one cost bigger than your opponent's cards on a given turn, which again, won't always work out because you won't have the right cost stuff at the right times, but sometimes you will that's gonna give you that nice little edge while still leading into that late game. And the games you whiff, I think your late game might still be able to contest from time to time. And the games where you don't whiff and Erishim gives you the nuts early on and gives you good cards to play and you still hit some late game bombs, uh, that's gonna give you some really big games. So in other words, I, you know, I, th there are of course disaster games for this card, which will happen, you will completely fall apart, but okay, take your cube and go. You know, that's fine. Like you're going to just take a one cube loss. There will be other games where you can do some big surprising things and actually net some big advantages, I think. So, you know, it's it's a deck, a deck construction problem for sure. You got to have the right kind of deck list, the right mix of stuff. But I think 
that the baseline advantage here is so strong and that playing above curve against your opponent, even with random stuff, is potentially good enough to really do the job for a late game package that could support it. So you won't want to run like high synergy stuff necessarily because you won't be able to accrue a synergistic deck game plan, but just running big stuff, big stats, things that play well on curve that are kind of independently successful. So, you know, the Doctor Dooms of the world are a great example. Yeah, I, I think there's a chance this actually becomes like a, a, a viable archetype. I think it's going to be like the best deck in the game. No, probably too inconsistent for those sorts of things. But I think this could be a viable climbing deck if you build it right, which I didn't really think when I first saw this card, but the more I've been cooking on this idea, I could see this coming together, which is good because I think this is going to be one of the most fun cards ever in Marvel Snap. Just getting to play with random stuff is is really enjoyable, not to mention surprising, which is another kind of cube bonus for this card is that your opponent does not know what to expect while you do have more information than them from playing your own airship. So you could sometimes extract some, some cube upside on that as well. So all of those things made me think this card actually looks pretty solid. So up next here, let's talk about Gilgamesh, uh, one of the cards that got changed from the initial data mined version. This is now a 5-7 that gives you plus one power for each of your other cards in play with increased power. So anything else with green numbers makes this guy bigger. It used to be a 5-2 that gave plus two power, which creates kind of a break point at five cards on board with increased power. If you have exactly five cards on board, those two designs are gonna be exactly the same. They're each gonna be 5-12s. But if you have uh, four or fewer cards on board, this new version of Gilgamesh will be bigger if you have, of course, six or more core cards on board with increased power than the old version of Gilgamesh would have been bigger. So just baking some, some baseline power here into Gilgamesh, but limiting the scaling, which I think maybe makes this card a little better. There are definitely considerations in, in both directions. Um, this one feels just better to play straight up. You don't have to go all in on some kind of crazy game plan for, for, for crazy scaling. Just, you know, two or three cards on board with increased power starts to put this into more elite power level values for five cost cards, getting into that nine, 10 plus space um, starts to make it pretty competitive from a power output standpoint. Whereas with that old card, you know, the sky was really the limit. You could have like 11 other buffed cards on board and it could gain 22 power, making it a 524 if you went absolutely crazy with like Squirrel Girls and Mysterios and a Blue Marvel or whatever. And ongoing cards do work for Gilgamesh, a question I know some people had. So it's like less of kind of a combo finisher almost where you're building your whole deck around this sort of game plan perhaps and more of a just like good, solid uh, reliable, trustworthy sort of card in decks that probably run a handful of uh, increased power cards. I mean, obviously you still want more, more is better, and this could still work very well in a swarm deck with the Kazar or Blue Marvel or some kind of ongoing buff card like that. We've also got stuff like, you know, Silver Surfers and Killmongers and so on that can tend to, to get a ton of buffs out across the board really effectively. I don't think Spectrum or Cerebro make much sense, but technically some possibilities there and i'm sure there are many other examples but it doesn't have to be that if you think about like even a destroy deck right like you got a you got a, a, a carnage and a venom those both have increased power stuff like that starts to fuel into uh your gilgamesh a little bit especially if there's a killmonger in the mix you know you could get four or five cards make gilgamesh a solid option is that going to be a thing no probably not destroy decks are too synergistic for that to really probably make room for a Gilgamesh, but you can see a, a variety of ways. Locations, of course, can also support this. You get a need of a Leer, four bodies in need of a Leer, that makes your Gilgamesh uh, four power bigger. I do think though that you're still gonna have to have a, a notable commitment to make this worth it. You know, it, it's gonna have to be a deck that's really keeping this in mind because otherwise, you know, a five, seven that sometimes is a five, eight or a five, nine randomly just isn't gonna be worth it. There are far too many other uh, synergistic game plans that, that really demand cards to fuel them and this won't necessarily fit in well. So that said, if you're really committing to make Gilgamesh worth it, which I, I think that's my premise, you probably have to commit a fair bit. It kind of makes me nervous. The old one in a weird way almost rewarded that commitment more. You know, you really leaned hard into that synergy and you were rewarded with a crazy big card. This is still like crazy big, don't get me wrong. If you have 11 cards on board, this is still a 518. 
which is still very big, very nuts. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with a 518 by any means, but it does just like, it doesn't play as well into Wong, you know, like there's there's a few different angles where I saw some intriguing lines for this that that now um, feel a bit more limited. So it's it's better to baseline. That's gonna feel better to play in many cases because if you whiff, you might still be able to get a solid line out of this. Whereas with that last version in the past, if you whiffed, you know, you might have like a 5-2 or 5-3 or something and, and had an unplayable card. So some feels bonus, still, you know, an interesting design, but I, I can't help but feel like a little bit of the upside has been stolen away here, which might limit a card that is so focused in its game plan. Part of me wonders if decks can come together as well around this or if they can do other better things faster also i think some of the best cards for this which are things like blue marvel unfortunately do share the same curve spot that that said my favorite home for this is still zoo deck load up a bunch of ones play blue marvel on five kazar on four whichever it is right this could be played on five after kazar or maybe on six with another one drop after playing a blue marvel on turn five and you've got yourself kind of you know a widespread of power with gilgamesh to splash somewhere you kind of expect your opponent to commit or you just need a big dump so I still can see this finding a home there, but I don't think this card packs quite as much craziness as it used to, and that might limit its utility a little more than we like. So moving on to Athena. This is a 2-1 that reads after each turn, plus three power if you played exactly two cards. And um, this is a lot of scaling on a low-cost card. We've seen some of these before where the scaling can be pretty gross um so if you play this on turn two and you start enacting this game plan on turn three uh you know you've got turn three four five and six in a normal game that's four turns to get this bonus which of course is 12 extra power which makes this a 213 which definitely would put her in contention with angela those sorts of, of two cost scalers that we hope to get really big uh and as far as the difficulty level here for thana I'm like really torn on this. I've been thinking about this actually surprising amount since this card uh, got data mined because I think it was pretty high on this in the data mine. I, my, my, my feelings have softened a little bit. I think at that era in particular, we were seeing a lot of like crazy, you know, Angela tempo decks and so on, which still exist. Don't get me wrong. We still have a lot of like Angela kitty hope packages floating around where that kitty pride becomes a really nice flex and a, potentially really synergistic card for Thana where you kind of play a good thing that's almost on curve and then your kitty to fill in to buff your Thana, right? And that gives you a little bit more flexibility about where you can play as well. You don't have to dump into Angela's location every single time, which maybe opens you up a little bit from some of that move package we see so often with Angela where you can still fill her location and kind of move around. But it does say, call into question, like those packages often have really good three drops in particular with Elsa and Hope. So you kind of always played like Angela on two and then a good three drop. Um, the Thana here, it's a little weird with that, right? Cause you play this on two and then you play a good three drop on three. That's only one card on turn three. So you're missing a turn of Thana. And then like, maybe you're off to the races from there cause you can kind of weave together a kitty and a big thing and, and, and build a curve around that and start buffing this, you know, three times is still very good. Like a two ten is nuts. That's still very good. But, the, you know, if there's hope in there, then it's like the energy gets a little weird. You get all this bonus energy. It's like, I kind of want to play three cards sometimes. And my Thana gets a little awkward. Not to mention, anytime you draw Thana away from turn two, like if you top deck this on turn five or six, it's going to be a very weak card, which you might say the same of Angela, but sometimes that Angela can be bailed out late. Like sometimes you do have like three things like an Angela on a final turn and she's still a two six. It's like, okay, you know, she showed up late, but we still got some work done. She still became... Uh, a competitive piece of our deck whereas Thane is not going to do that like you maybe get one buff out of her if you play her and exactly one other card late uh, I think she'll work counting herself on a given turn uh, but it's going to be really hard to bail her out late so you kind of do have to make sure you get this one early now you could play Thana on turn three so play Thana and Kitty Pride together that would be your two cards she'd start scaling on turn three anyway and then like on turn four play your three drop and a kitty you know there are some ways to kind of back that up so maybe you literally play angela on two thana on three hope or elsa or whatever on four and then go from there but it just creates this kind of check or limitation where in some ways you you like the kitty pride for that but then you also might want to play like two things in a kitty and suddenly you're really limited so 
I, I, the more I think about this, the more I fear it's just going to be awkward to maintain this, or uh, maybe not really that awkward, because obviously you're going to have the choices in a given game. Perhaps awkward to build a deck list that naturally maintains this, because, you know, if you're building in enough little card flexibility to weave in alongside more medium sized cards and stuff, then sometimes you're going to have only two little cards or only two medium sized cards, and it's all going to fall apart because you're not gonna have the right sort of mix or you're gonna need to do certain things uh, just to react to a given game state and you won't be able to. It's like, oh man, I need to go for kill and I need to like dump a bunch of stats and kill and then I can't do it because of the thing or whatever. Right? Like, there's like little weird things that happen uh, that throw this off. So a lot of potential scaling here is always promising. I, I think there's a possibility this is fine. And it's like one of those like, okay, I'll just play this instead of Angela. It's still pretty good. You know, I still get a two seven. Sometimes I'm happy, but I have a feeling this is going to have a hard time out competing cards that are in that similar space. Like, do you run this over Angela? I don't think the way the decks are currently built. So where does this start finding a home in that case? You know, it's, it's not just in a vacuum. Can this card be played successfully? It's can this card out compete its peers? Suddenly, when you start asking that question, I'm a little bit less excited about Thana than I was. I think this could end up feeling clunky despite the potential crazy scaling. So next up here is Cersei. This is a 5-7. That seems to be their go-to now for 5 drops, by the way. We've seen a, a rash of 5-7s. <laughs> That's the sweet spot, clearly. Uh, on reveal, transform your other cards here into random cards that cost one more if able and um yeah i think this card actually looks pretty cool this gives me kind of blink-esque vibes right where you're taking something uh small and junky who had some kind of you know effect you were hoping to realize often an on reveal effect and then you're hopefully turning it into something big and awesome now the the primary difference of course blink was a little bit more controlled you could build your deck list around blink to to take that four drop on reveal and turn it into a big six drop or whatever. And you knew what the big six drop was going to be because you put those in your deck. And that was very reliable. Whereas with Cersei, uh, it's definitely a lot more chaotic, a lot more of a mixed bag. If you try to transform a four drop with Cersei, you might get some weird random five drop that's not very helpful or perhaps even sometimes actively detrimental. It rolls a Dr. Octopus, you pull your opponent's giant hand out and you just throw in a location, right? Like there are some definite downsides. The upside, on the other hand, for Cersei, of course, is that she can transform multiple cards in a given location. So you could throw a bunch of junky on reveal stuff in a given location, right? You got like a white tiger and an iron heart or whatever, you know, just threw a bunch of cards and have any stats. They're all junk. I realize their benefit elsewhere through their on reveal. And then I dump a Cersei and I get to go all in one. So I, you know, I can turn my iron heart into a cold obsidian. And I can turn my uh, white tiger into a scar. And suddenly I took an iron heart and a white tiger that were garbage. And I've just absolutely owned this crazy location. Now, th the kind of risk there is that Cersei's also going to be there. So you are sometimes committing uh, potentially in a big um, like power output all into one spot. You're kind of going hard all in on somewhere, which, you know, the, the iron heart and the white tiger shifted some power elsewhere. That's fine. in that exact example, but just something to keep in mind. Like it is like, I'm trying to get big and I'm committing more power. I'm trying to get big or trying to realize this upside. So it could occasionally feel like an overcommitment. Now that said, I think there are also some just like uh, other benefits of like summoned cards. So the example that comes to mind most readily is Sentry with the void if you're not going to play an annihilus if you miss your annihilus this could be a backup if you don't want to play annihilus you want to do your own thing with with sentry play a sentry on turn four that void is a four cost card you can use cersei to turn that void into a big five drop so you get you know a nice four eight on turn four you get a nice five seven and then you also get a bonus five drop as well which even like super low rolls don't feel so bad if you're taking a negative eight and turn to get into something awesome, which given certain matchups, you know, even if you are running in an Isla stack, if your opponent loads up and you know your void isn't going to go to their side, this could be a way to kind of shift out of that or do something cool. Now, that does require, again, some, like, finagling when it comes to, to deck building. You probably have to make something work really spicy there, but there are those kind of opportunities that exist for Cersei as well. So, um, I, I don't know, man. The, 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 the card here offers a lot of potential, but it's always sort of hedged by that uh, that note of, of chaos 
and unpredictability, which is a real concern, I think, for this one. Blink was controlled, reliable, predictable, knowable, solvable, all the things we like in Marvel Snap, particularly when we're making cube decisions and snap decisions. Um, you want to know what's going on. Cersei is just a big toss-up, and although there is a lot of potential for high rolls, there are a lot of potential as well that you just kind of wasted your turn five and didn't really do or achieve much. So um, it's going to require some really sneaky good deck building. It's going to require specific sort of sequences, I think, like Sentry Void into Cersei. Like, that's clearly a good line, but when that doesn't line up, how good is this card? How many opportunities start to exist? So... To me, uh, that makes this one pretty unreliable and pretty iffy. I have fears about making this card work, although it looks very fun. I'm excited to try this a ton as a fun card. I don't know how many decks can make this um, a, a good piece of their kind of synergistic game plan. So next up here, we've got Makari. This is a 3-3 after the turn. Runs from your hand to a random location if possible. So... This is sort of in that like Angel or M'Baku space where she's just summoning herself into play. Could be on turn one, if you get this in your opening hand, she just jumps onto board. Uh, could be at any given stage of the game, basically a free, you don't have to spend any energy on it, three power. Which, you know, hey, zero three, perfect efficiency, better than, you know, <laughs> Wasp or Yellow Jacket or whatever, right? I love it, and uh, does of course have potential upsides like Cerebro 3 decks, Silver Surfer, etc. There are some game plans you could put this in uh, that could definitely support this. I, I think, you know, that's fine. It's not free really because there is of course a, a resource cost, like you suddenly don't have that card in hand anymore. So you gave up that slot in your deck and you gave up that resource in your hand for this three power. So it has to be worth that exchange because choices in hand resources in hand are definitely valuable slots and deck are definitely valuable as well so this is not like suddenly a card you can put in every deck and just say hey it's a free three power in every single deck i just don't think that happens some decks just won't be willing to sacrifice that cohesion in order to gain three free power because three free power in the scheme of some decks just won't matter so will there be enough decks that can extract enough bonus value like we said cerebro silver surfer etc where this starts to feel like a really meaningful contribution to the deck's game plan. Alternatively, there are, you know, worlds where maybe just emptying your hand is beneficial. We've seen like dump decks with strong guy. Maybe it's just nice to have a card you know is gonna get out of hand so you can get some free power and still support a strong guy. Even things like Moon Girl sometimes. It's like you have hand size problems in Moon Girl decks. Maybe you toss this in a Moon Girl deck just to make sure your hand's not getting clogged up so you have space for your Moon Girl to copy the cards that you care about. Now, one other important consideration for this card that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about is maybe priority management. Uh, you get a free three power. It is a random location which can make priority hard, but sometimes just having the numbers on board early is really important for um, priority management. Now, what kind of decks would care enough about that? There's like, you know, Galactus is a classic example. Random location might be hard for a Galactus deck once again. I think there's actually some unexplored space still around like Sandman as a like finisher of sorts and a really high tempo deck where you're just trying to get ahead on priority in, in multiple locations, potentially all three. Drop that Sandman on turn five and kind of lock out your opponent's ability to contest multiple spots. I think there's something kind of cool there. Makari could play nicely into that. Just get that early dump as quickly as possible so you don't have to spend uh, energy to get this tempo and get this priority. So uh, that's probably the space I'm like most interested in exploring for Makari aside from some of that sort of obvious stuff. So there are some like sneaky, really high level ways to use this potentially. Doesn't necessarily make it a card that we see a lot though or see in a lot of decks. I think many decks will just uh, choose to to favor things that are, are really good fits instead of you know this this very efficient three power but uh still some some intriguing potential i think and then finally here we have fastos this is a uh, three three on reveal give each card in your deck negative one cost or plus two power now i have to say i, I was a lot lower on this card in my last uh like the the leaked cards preview than many of you were. Many of you were like most hyped about this card, thought it looked like the best card of the set even, I think for many people. I'm not sure I've gotten to that level just yet, but I am a little higher, I think, on Fastos. 
than I was. Maybe that's not even true necessarily. Maybe it's just that I'm a lot lower on some of these cards than I was. Like I think Thana and Cersei look a lot worse to me now. So by comparison, Fastos looks a little better, but I still don't actually think this card is as insane as many of you. So the idea here, of course, you know, you play this down on turn three and you basically kind of juice up your next three draws, you know, your turn four, five and six draw in a normal given game. Of course, magic could extend that a little bit. Um, and, you, you know, you're, you're gaining, you know, maybe plus six power. You could get all three power buffs. You know, you could get negative three costs. So this is, you know, effectively a three nine if you get plus six power, right? You get a three three plus six for free or or maybe you know you get negative three cost and this is kind of effectively a zero three um or you know a mix thereof but somewhere in between that that space it's a it's a two seven you know or something right and that's an interesting way to think about this from kind of a like total net like efficiency output standpoint but i think that's a little bit unfair because those aren't really like particularly crazy numbers uh, but it's unfair in, in, in two directions. Number one, like, you know, cost discounts can obviously be more beneficial as like a surprise value later on. So can buffs, frankly, as well. Kind of having your opponent deal with unexpected values and like, oh man, does their, does their one card now cost two instead of three? And does that create some kind of opportunity? Is there Shang-Chi threes? And now they can play it alongside a Silver Surfer. Like there's interesting little things that happen. Or it's like, oh, the Shang-Chi's plus five. That doesn't really matter at all. And the other side of that, the other reason I, I think that's... Um, a little bit unfair is that you're not actually i think always going to be playing the cards that you draw after you fastos fastest fastos fastos uh sometimes they're just not going to be the cards you need they're just not going to fit into your curve sometimes you're going to need to play things that were already in hand and you might only get like one or two of the fastos cards to actually matter on top of that I, sometimes the cost discount might not even matter if you're playing like a silver surfer deck for instance you know uh, whether Sarah or otherwise, you often have kind of a fixed plan where you're playing two, three drops on turn six, or with Sarah, you're playing three, three drops on turn six. If one of them now costs one less, it doesn't necessarily help you, right? You might still just play three, three drops on turn six. You don't always have like a one drop to fill in the curve or whatever. Um, so, and, and sometimes the power might be a little bit of an overkill. If it hits, you know, a location you're already winning a ton, then it's like, oh, okay, well. Uh, that didn't really do much or, or or change the impact of the game much. So in other words, you know, it's it's hard to know what you're going to get. And in the same way that can help against an opponent's plans, it can also maybe not make much of an impact because you just don't have a, a kind of reliable outcome. Like if you knew that this was always going to give discounts, you could build your deck in a way where that made sense. It's like, okay, I know my three drops are potentially going to cost two and then Sarah's going to make them cost one and I can adjust my curve and build my deck around that. But I don't always know that. And if it's like, it's all buffs, I can build a deck that's all about buffs, which sometimes happens anyway in Silver Surfer, but you could like really lean in to, to Brood and Okoye and the buff crew, you know, and, and get a Sebastian Shaw in there and know that it's going to be more reliable. But instead it's like, oh, well, my Shaw costs two now. I don't really have any way to really benefit from that necessarily. I, the, the the unpredictability here makes me nervous from a deck construction standpoint it may be true that you just toss this in a silver surfer deck and it just kind of does enough and just like okay well uh you know i got plus two here that mattered i got negative one here that mattered and from game to game that just kind of stacks up as a generically useful sort of bonus but again remember this has to compete against other cards in your deck that would be doing things like yes i can imagine scenarios where this feels totally fine to play on turn three and you get a bonus it's cool but was there a three drop you could have played instead that just did something bigger and better would you rather just have the power output baked into the card now like a gladiator instead of trying to get plus two on other cards later maybe you just want the power now maybe you want like a nocturne to have some kind of location manipulation upside and more base power. There's all these considerations you have to make because this is competing against its peers. I don't know. I don't think this is as plug and play and as easy as most people seem to think. I don't think it's bad either though. Like you hear me out, you know, like I said, there are definitely upsides to this. There are moments where this will matter. It will hit the shawl sometimes. You could lean into a full buff package and make something kind of neat out of this, which is what I'll be trying to do. But I just don't think it's as simple as like, oh, this card does good stuff, it's gonna be good. It has to be that this card does stuff better than other cards. And this one being so inconsistent and so unpredictable, 
is going to be a deck construction downside that is a limiter as much or more as it's going to be kind of a game state upside where it it, it it sort of you know fools your opponent or whatever so in other words i am still sort of middling on fastos kind of not 100 percent sold this card's insane like many of you but i will acknowledge that i seem to be the lone person with this opinion everybody else loves this card so uh um, it might just be me he does look really cool so i will definitely try to make something awesome out of this i'm just not as sold as you guys all right so all that said let's uh let's rate these cards from one to four stars and uh we'll do it in order too so we're gonna start with the best and go to the worst Erishim is a three-star card, and yeah, I'm saying he's the best, believe it or not. Gilgamesh is a three-star card. Fastos is a three-star card, but really like a two and a half. If I could put him right in the middle, I would, which, you know, I make up the rules, so I could. So let's say for the first time ever, he's a two and a half-star card. Thaina is a two-star card. Makari is a two-star card. And Cersei is a two-star card. So yeah, there you go. Uh, not the highest scores for me. I think last month, everything was three or above. This month, we've definitely got some more middling uh, stuff, which doesn't change my hype much. I think a lot of these cards look really fun. Erishim, fun, most fun looking card we've ever had. Like, Thayna looks kind of fun to try to like puzzle it out every turn, find the best line. Cersei's chaotic and crazy, you know. Fastos is actually really fun too um but you know a lot of conditionality baked into some of these cards you know Thana, gilgamesh um fastos kind of have like inconsistency issues perhaps like do they do they work all the time what are the results going to be some like deck construction concerns as well for those uh then there's just like an output question for some of these like do the numbers get quite big enough to match the sort of conditionality or inconsistency problems that they have. And I don't know, man. I don't know if the numbers get that exciting for me. So a few, I think, playable looking cards. That's that three-star space, like Erishim, Gilgamesh, and uh, Fastos to me. Like, they make the cut in decks. Just maybe not like meta reshaping, meta dominant kind of cards. I think Makara, Cersei, and Dana might have a harder time. Although, Dana does have really big numbers, which sometimes just gets there. Like, is she good enough that that she just gets there, but then Shadow King shows up. So I don't know, man. A lot of these feel like they're gonna have trouble out competing the decks we have today. Like we have some really high output, crazy big number decks. And I just don't see these cards getting to those sort of levels necessarily. Erishim maybe has the most potential, but we'll see. I hope I'm wrong. A lot of these cards look really fun. I'm excited to play them. I just hope they aren't uh, too low from a power level standpoint, but maybe you guys have a bit more faith in most of these than I do. Share those thoughts down in the comments below. And as always, uh, thanks so much for watching and until next time, game on.